Welcome everybody to another edition of our FYI webinar series with Palkus. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angela Samos. Uh, this webinar is about investing in Portugal and uh, business opportunities there as well. And we're really honored to have uh, Stefan Moraes here, who is Managing General Partner of Indico Capital, which is based in Lisbon, a VC fund based in Lisbon. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, his, his company and what they look for and how they invest and then just the general opportunities that are there for folks to get involved. Um, everybody is on listen only mode. And so if you have a question, please use the toolbar at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and I will read it out to Stefan. And then if you have additional questions afterwards that you didn't think of during the webinar, you can always send them to us at, at uh, palcus at palcus.org and we will either answer ourselves or, or get the question over to Stefan for you. And so this is our presenter today. And so welcome, Stefan. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this with us today. My pleasure. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. And, um, and then you're going to share your screen and, and walk us through. Yeah, no, it's a real, a real pleasure to, to, to be here with all of you. Let me just try to share my screen properly and see if this works. And we'll get on with it. Um, there we go. I picked presentation and uh, just try to do one, this one, full screen mode. There we go. Can you see the screen? Uh, almost. Yes, there we go. Yes, I can see it. There we go. There we go. So we Perfect. can start. So the idea for the next uh, for the next uh, twenty minutes or so is to have um, a little bit of a, a rundown on what's been happening in Portugal in general, but more specifically in the tech scene. And I will also cover briefly a few other sectors which I think could be could be interesting for for your for your members. But just to say that you know for me it's a real pleasure. I've lived in the U.S. as well in the past. I've studied in the U.S. Uh, and and I have deep appreciation for the Portuguese community and and, and obviously everyone else uh, in in the US, and uh, and it's also a privilege to 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 present to such a, a good and smart group of people, uh, with so much knowledge in in so many industries and and so on. Um, I've moved back to Portugal since living in the US. I've then moved back to other countries and back to Portugal and on and off from Portugal for half of my life, I guess. And, um, and I've recently launched, about a year ago, launched uh, uh, my own venture capital fund, uh, which will be the focus of this presentation. But I want to go a little bit broader and, and, and share a few other, uh, other insights and, and looking forward to your, to, to your questions during and after the, the presentation. Um, maybe starting by the by the tech environment. You know, Portugal hasn't been particularly well known for being a tech country. Uh, we are no Silicon Valley, um, and certainly other European countries, even not considering the U.S., there's other European countries which are, you know, obviously more famous for engineering, such as Germany or fintech, such as the U.K. and so on and so on. Uh, but the truth is, we have built up an impressive track record as a country over the last decade or so. And this has to do with a, with a few factors and a few uh, changes in the country which have been very, very positive over the last decades. Uh, as you know, Portugal has evolved immensely uh, since the 70s and 80s and 90s. It continues to evolve, obviously. And one of the big changes in the country has been in the education sector. Um, and I think that one of the pillars of the current tech revolution, if we could call it a revolution, is essentially the fact that currently you know, the, the, the education system in, in Portugal is quite robust. It has its challenges, of course, like any other country and then any other public sector and private sector. But the truth is uh, the Portuguese universities, not only in Lisbon, but really throughout Portugal, and I would certainly uh, would like to mention Porto or Braga, you know, University of Minho, obviously Coimbra, uh, Aveiro and, and, and a few other uh, cities uh, throughout the country, north to south, 
have really been uh, preparing very, very well uh, a considerable number of undergraduate and graduate students. And many of those graduate students have also, and undergraduate students, have done Erasmus, which is a program that sends students to complete their studies or do part of their undergraduate and graduate studies throughout Europe and nowadays throughout the world. And we have seen also in the last decade or two decades, a huge number of, of uh, PhDs and master students uh, go and, and do part, or if not all of their education in top universities throughout the world, including obviously the US. And, and many of these uh, students and professionals stayed, but many also came back. And so what you've seen is a significant, significant rise in, in, in the level of education of the country in general, uh, if you, particularly if you compare it obviously to, to pre-revolution years, but you've also seen in the last decade or two a really, really uh, huge increase in proportion of uh, in quality and numbers of, of highly, highly educated, highly specialized uh, people, namely in science and engineering. And it forms essentially the basis of a good uh, technology uh, ecosystem. Um, so I would say that this is this is the basis of, of the of a favorable Portuguese tech market because people come out of the university and some of them keep on being researchers and, and many of them uh, go and find you know qualified jobs throughout the world in Portugal and obviously elsewhere. Uh, but many also decide to start their companies. And they also decide can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I thought there was a question coming. Um, and so uh, this forms the basis of, of, of the ecosystem, but then obviously what happens is that there is an ongoing global uh, revolution in tech, you know, uh, an industrial revolution that is changing the world. And obviously these students and all the Portuguese society is not uh, outside of that, of that revolution. And I'd say that the Portuguese, the highly qualified Portuguese in particular, have a pretty good global, uh, broad and diverse uh, mindset in general, particularly those that went abroad, but, but not only. Um, and obviously, you know, the spread of internet and information technology and, and information in general uh, leads people to become more global, more ambitious in a good sense. And uh, typically the, 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 the ambitions of, of uh, a typical uh, young uh, professional are the same now, um, both, you know, in, in Braga or in Delaware or in, in China. So it's, it's all become very, very global and people want to follow on the footsteps of you know, Mark Zuckerberg and the likes mm -hmm. and, and so on. Yeah, I would, I would say um, that, that was a great summary and spot on. And as a, someone observing from the United States, it's been really amazing to watch how, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, all the news was about how everybody was leaving Portugal. There were no opportunities. And now to see this thriving tech community and, and, and other industries as well, and people coming back, it's been really amazing to watch. So Thanks for a great summary. That was really great. Um, and I just want to let you know that if you have changed slides, we have, I haven't seen that. So just want to make sure that that was coming right. through. I have not changed slides. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll probably, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll change slides to a Portuguese favorable tech market. I hope you're seeing that one. Uh, if you're still in the number. Uh, not yet. No, you're not, you're not there. Okay, okay. Oh, God. Okay. Let me see. I'll change it back up and down. Have you, have you seen now the, the slide number one? I'm still seeing the cover slide. Okay. Well, I'll talk through it and hopefully at some stage you'll see mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. In any okay. case, it's about tech talent, it's about the global mindset, and it's also about expertise and diversity. I mean, it's it's also one of just to what you were mentioning, Angela, not only are the Portuguese returning, but there's also lots of foreigners coming to live in, in, right. in for a number of reasons. I would say that the, the global crisis hit Portugal uh, pretty hard. We had, as you know, an intervention, a foreign intervention uh, from the IMF and, 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 and so on and other institutions. And in fact, there were a lot of people leaving, but that also opened up the door for a lot of people to try their own luck in building their own companies. And eventually with the resurgence of the tourism sector, which is a, a big booming sector and the real estate sector, which is also another very important sector and that has been doing extremely well, revitalizing the cities and in the whole country this has led to more sophistication and to the discovery to a certain extent of lisbon and porto and many other cities has very high quality of life right 
very safe environments in within the European context, which is already safe compared to the rest of the world, with good quality of life, good food, uh, and 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 so on. And this has led to a lot of diversity and a lot of people coming back, and also to a lot of foreigners moving, particularly from the US. We we've, we've seen in the last two years, uh, lots of US citizens and 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 Portuguese Americans uh, come back because of this quality of life, and this this peacefulness that 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 we have. Uh, thank God in this country. I'm going yes. to move to slide number three, although you cannot, you probably can't see it, unfortunately. Yeah, I wonder if um, your screen sharing is paused. Sometimes that will, will do it. Okay, let me see. Let me see how I could do that. I'll stop share and I'll, I'll reshare again. Okay. Close that one. Acrobat Reader, share two. Are we yep. There? Okay. Portuguese global scale ups. Yep. Yeah. I'll just show you the, the previous slide just so you oh, know. Okay. You, Perfect. Month, I, I, I think I've talked through this. Right. Uh, the, second, the second slide is more, you know, so what happened? I mean, you know, you had all this revolution with these people and so on. And really what happened? And this slide is a summary of the success stories, so to say, because of course there's, there's companies here which are yet to be sold uh, and some might still fail. You never know with, with, with tech startups, of course. But all in all, I would say that, uh, you know, the, these companies that are here, these 14 companies, they have raised, they are, these are Portuguese companies originally, founded by Portuguese uh, entrepreneurs uh, with Portuguese technology. Of course, many of them are now global. You know, Farfetch is probably the, the most well-known of all that IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange for over $6 billion. Uh, it reached uh, a height of $8 billion. I think now it's, it's a little bit smaller than that on the stock market, but a few other exits and in in, in, in a few unicorns. Um, and 14 countries, 14 companies, I, I apologize. 14 companies that have raised capital from uh, investors from all over the world, investors in Silicon Valley, top VC funds. These companies have invested at least 5 million each, and, and some of them have raised in, in excess of $1 billion dollars. Uh, during their their lifetime, and they're doing rather well, and they're seen many of them as as global winners or potential global winners. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's just to say that when we compare ourselves to some other European countries, we're doing rather well. Of course, you'd say, well, in Silicon Valley, you know, there's companies raising five million every every day, and it's nothing special. Yes, it's true, but we are a small country. We don't really have a, a, a track record in doing this for more than six to 10 years. And it's quite impressive for, for a country like Portugal, even compared to the rest of, of Europe, uh, to have produced such an enormous amount of talent. In my own previous portfolio, when I was at Caixa Capital, we raised for our companies, uh, I mean, the companies raised uh, now over $1 billion. And for each euro that, that we put in, over 69 euros uh, came in from foreign investors. And this was unprecedented. This had, had never happened before in the Portuguese history, certainly not in the, in the tech history. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge accomplishment for a, for a small country. And I must say that uh, contrary to other statistics where Portugal probably comes uh, down in the bottom half or even the, last, uh, this, the, the, the lower tier of, of countries in Europe in many statistics, um, in, in tech and in, in, in this market, we are certainly in the top tier. I, I believe uh, that we are in the top 10 uh, European countries in terms of capacity to produce global startups and, and, and these companies are, are make good, good, good show for it. So yeah, I, I would just to comment, I would absolutely agree. And even just the sheer number of startups that you see in Portugal, the, the entire country is astonishing. Um, and I feel that, I don't know about you, Stefan, but when I'm there, I get the same sense of uh, excitement and entrepreneurship that one feels here in Silicon Valley, right? A lot of people have ambitions to, you know, they're thinking about starting their own company and they have the confidence to do it versus, you know, talking themselves out of it or thinking that it's not possible. So that sense of an entrepreneurship and adventure and ambition is, is very similar to what we feel here in Silicon Valley. So it's very, it's very exciting. For sure, for sure. I think I think you're absolutely right. And it's again, not only Lisbon, it's throughout the country, which is even better because it means, you know, that now everybody, you know, to a certain, to a certain extent, it's the world is flat, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's the famous Thomas Friedman 
um, book, which, which shows that now anybody can do it. And I think that in Portugal, uh, particularly because of the level of education and the level of English, and also the fact that it's a small market, and we will cover that as a, as a positive, uh, I think we're, we're, we're right up there with, with the top countries uh, in, in Europe. And so what happened essentially, and to get into sort of The Indico story was that we, you know, set up something um, original and 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 the first in, in in Portugal, investing particularly in in early stage tech, uh, nothing that hasn't uh, existed in the valley for over fifty years. But the truth is, in in Portugal, we had mainly uh, state-owned actors and corporate related actors, and not really independent VCs. And as you know, independent VCs are basi- form essentially the basis of all the success stories throughout the world, particularly the early stage success stories you know all the all the major companies globally in tech they started with little funds like ours and obviously then they became they they attracted more and more capital and they became you know the apples and googles of this world but they started with independent venture capital funds that not only provided them with capital but provided them with uh, expertise so when we launched uh, late last year and we announced in 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 january we got you know all these reviews from 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 foreign and and tech related uh, media posts uh, saying you know Lisbon finally gets a substantial VC fund in the shape of of Indico, and we do have currently investors from from all over the world. I'll show it in in the next slide, uh, and close to thirty to to forty nine million, um, so nearing on on the fifty million mark. Um, which is unprecedented for Portugal, and particularly because these 36 investors are a little bit from not all over the world, but you know nine different countries. So you'd expect maybe to have Portuguese only Portuguese investors, but not really. Which means also that there are people and there are institutions throughout the world that believe that there is that it's a good investment to invest in Portuguese related technology. And when I say Portuguese related technology, it's not that the countries that we invest in. Uh, work only in Portugal, sell in Portugal. Obviously, they don't. They sell globally, and we'll cover that a little bit later. But it gives you a sense of a, of a new level of confidence in the in the Portuguese tech sector and in the Portuguese economy, which until recently was seen as you know a, a place where you wouldn't want to invest because people thought that the euro was going to uh, break up and they thought that Portugal was going to go down the drain and Greece and so on and so on. And suddenly, here we are. Uh, five or six years later with with institutional investors from all over the world investing in in a, in a vc fund based out of out of portugal so it's it's quite encouraging for the economy and for our tech sector just to give you a little bit of of a rundown on on who we are so uh, my name is stefan Murais. i'm 45 i i i've studied at uh, technical engineering and then i did an mba at harvard business school I have a background in banking, consulting, um, but also management and entrepreneurship. Uh, my partner, Ricardo, worked with me extensively while we were at Caixa. So we, we had the pleasure and, and the luck of finding all those gold nuggets uh, from the last uh, decade or so and investing in almost all the success stories coming out of the country when we were at Caixa. And so he joined me in this uh, new venture of setting up our own independent uh, VC fund. And independent here is a very important uh, word in in a small country uh, like Portugal. And we were very honored to be joined and invited uh, Cristina Fonseca, which is a brilliant uh, engineer uh, specialized currently in AI AI, and also the co-founder of TalkDesk, one of the big success stories from Portugal, uh, currently selling globally a big hit in Silicon Valley with investors from all over the world, uh, nearing $1 billion valuation. And she is now just a happy shareholder at uh, at uh, TalkDesk, and joined us from from the get go. And she's also a non-executive uh, board member at Galp, as you know, one of the major uh, the major uh, energy and oil company in Portugal, and one of the majors in 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 Europe. Um, and so, uh, what 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 does a VC uh, fund do really, and why do we think that this is a good idea to do it in in Portugal? Um, I always say that, you know, for those of you that like soccer or football, as we call it here, as you know, um, we are like um, the people, the coaches that find the young kids and get them on a path to eventually join uh, the Champions League. Uh, so this is what we call the pre-seed to, to, to IPO 
uh, route. Uh, you find uh, a company uh, which has a promising technology and maybe some initial sales and a very ambitious team. We'll cover that, you know, what are our criteria at the beginning. And you give them essentially some seed or pre-seed money in exchange for a small participation of, you know, 10 to 30%, something like that, to 15, 20%. And, and you give them in exact enough capital for them to achieve, you know, the next milestones of the next 12 to 18 months. And essentially you help them achieve those metrics by helping them um, get talent, you know, hiring, uh, develop better business plans, increase sales, put them in touch with clients, put them in touch with partners and give them general guidance on marketing, sales, strategy, finance, and, and everything else really. So we become partners of business. If things go well, we keep on investing um, for another percentage around the same sort of, you know, 15 to 20% uh, every time there is a round of capital and you keep on increasing the size of the rounds. And this is what is called a pre-seed round and then a seed round and then, then maybe a series A, series B and so on until the company is ready to, to, to exit within a time frame of, of, of 10 years and hopefully uh, a bit less. Of course, what happens is we have 50 million and so we can only do up to 5 million investment per company. And naturally, uh, as soon as we can, we start attracting other uh, foreign VCs, other specialized venture capital firms that we partner with throughout the world and that help the company go to the next stage. So typically we are what Benfica or Sporting or Porto, whatever you, what is your favorite club in Portugal would do. They would find these youngsters they would train them in, in our local you know, sort of junior championships and so on. And once they're ready, we're going to call Real Madrid and, and, and they're going to take over and they're going to make Ronaldo an even bigger uh, global superstar. So it's very much so like football. Uh, and, and obviously the stars are the entrepreneurs, the stars and the results are, are, are their results. But we, we are very, very active in coaching and in being on the ground and hence uh, that's why you know early stage VCs like ours only invest locally. Locally means for us Portugal and Spain at best, uh, but not throughout not throughout the world. It doesn't mean that we can't do it, but it means that you know to be able to add value, you really need to be close to the companies, uh, you know, preferably driving distance, so that we can have uh, very frequent uh, conversations, not only on the phone but real, real working uh, conversations where we can help the company achieve their metrics. Obviously, you know, if, if, if things don't go well, you know, which is quite natural and, and works, you know, happens quite a lot in young companies, whether they're startups, tech or not. Uh, young companies have a hard time surviving. And if it doesn't go well, it's fine. It will, it's, and people should, everybody should learn with their mistakes and try not to, not to repeat them. But the idea is that eventually, uh, one or two of these 20 or so companies uh, in the portfolio end up being big global winners and end up in this, in this, you know, listing in, in, in the US or, or elsewhere and, and, and producing massive, massive returns that return the fund uh, multiple times. And for that, of course, you, you end up relying on lots of ecosystem partners. So in Portugal and Spain, there's lots of incubators, you know, places where, where companies, startups um, share uh, working spaces and where they learn with each other and, and with investors and angels that, and, and VCs that are in those spaces. And there's also lots of accelerators from, from Google to Techstars to, to many other 500 startups and so on, they do come here frequently and have um, also programs in, in Portugal and Spain. And there's also local accelerators that help really, that are uh, sort of like early stage training grounds to propel the companies to a, an, another level. And obviously we have very close relationships with uh, universities where the ideas come from, uh, incubators where they, where they literally sit and accelerators where they're being prepared for to receive investment from us. We get a lot of deal flow also that doesn't come from, from, from these sort of uh, origins because of the track record and, and the fact that we have uh, been very fortunate to have backed most of the success stories. We end up getting a lot of referrals from, from, from entrepreneurs and they just knock at our door and, and would love to work with us. And, and we have uh, a way of obviously distinguishing between the ones that, that are we think are potential Ronaldos and the ones that we think are potentially good businesses, but not VC and the ones that we just think they're not good businesses, which is also happens quite often, obviously. 
So what do we look for and, and, and what is it hot in, in, in Portugal and what can we expect from, from theoretically a small country, but actually with a lot of engineering and a lot of talent. So we see Portugal has essentially mostly a B2B country with uh, talented engineering. Uh, so the engineers, because there is no local market, they tend to think of solving problems for companies which means B2B solutions, mainly in software. And nowadays we see a lot of obviously enterprise SaaS with layers of uh, big data analytics and, and obviously artificial intelligence and machine learning on top to, to make the solution smarter. I would say almost that there is no company that we would invest in that wouldn't have some sort of level of, of intelligence on top because that's what you need nowadays to be competitive uh, globally. But it's also true that you see sometimes now and again a few B2C winners, so companies that, that uh, are wanting to take on uh, the, the sort of retail markets, and those are normally in the form of marketplaces. So Farfetch, for example, is a, a marketplace that brings together high-end luxury brands with, uh, you know, high, with shoppers all over the world. And in our case, in the current fund, for example, one of the companies that is doing extremely well is a company called Barkin, which, uh, which supplies essentially dog food and dog supplies and online vet to, 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 to pet owners and dog owners uh, all over the world. And, and that is obviously apparently not unique, but it is unique in the way that they're doing it in a very highly personalized uh, marketing. And also uh, you can see it in their own results. Uh, so these are the two main areas, which doesn't mean that we don't see uh, projects in the areas of blockchain, uh, Internet of Things, robotics, computer vision, uh, obviously fintech, and obviously cybersecurity. These are areas where also there are there is heavy domain expertise within Portuguese universities, uh, and also from foreign entrepreneurs that have relocated to Portugal, and and we see all those all those types of companies. So what do we look for when you're a venture capitalist? and compare ourselves to sort of a regular uh, angel um, which has similar criteria but a bit different and certainly very different from from many more sort of amateur investors which which we try to which, which we many times find to look for companies which are interesting or which they really like the team but don't go really that deep into into the, the technicalities of the business or the technology or the finance there's a number of criteria that professional VCs use and, and are very stubborn about. And I would start with obviously uh, the uniqueness of, of the solution that uh, the company is proposing. If you want to be a global winner, you have to be very, very different. You have to be unique. And so the first criteria, not the most important, but the first criteria that we try to understand when a company presents to us is, is it unique? You know, is it 10 times better than anything out there throughout the world, including Silicon Valley and Taiwan and China and India and so on. And that's a pretty tough test, as you can uh, imagine. And so if, if we're convinced that it could be something really unique that will change and could be eventually a global winner, then we need to understand whether this industry that they're targeting, the, pro the problem that they're trying to solve is indeed a very big problem. Because again, we need very big exits to compensate for the risk of the portfolio. We need the ones that are, will be the winners. The big, big exits will, will have to be really big to compensate everything else that despite the fact that we thought they were big originally, didn't do it and didn't, didn't make it till the end. Uh, and so first is, is it a unique way of solving a problem? And the second question is, is it a big problem so that the sales can be big and the valuation can be can be big and we can have a potential unicorn or something something close to that. And of course, to do to make that work and to make it happen, you obviously need a very, very special team. So that's a third uh, big, big uh, criteria is it is is this the right team to, to take it global and to make a global winner, which means are they ambitious enough? You need to be very ambitious to create a unicorn. Um, do they know what they're talking about? Normally today to become a global winner, you need to come up with something extremely, extremely smart. Even if it's, if, even if it looks very simple from on the eyes of the consumer on, you know, the back end, the, 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 the technical part be, be behind it needs to be very, very smart and very sophisticated. Otherwise probably it's not very difficult to copy. So the team needs to be very technically, technically very, very strong very ambitious, but they also need to be to a certain point, a little bit humble because they're going to work with us 
very, very closely. And after us, they will work with many other funds in the different rounds of funding. And these are funds which have very strong opinions and, and want to show them the way as best as they can in partnership with the team. So the team needs to be fairly flexible to take on feedback and to take on criticism so that everybody can, can get along. So uh, these are difficult criteria which result normally in, in very small percentage of, of companies that we invest. I'll share with you some, some current numbers of our deal flow for the last two years. Angela, can you see this, this slide with the pyramid? Yep, I see it. Yep, so this gives you a little bit of a sense. You know, if you think that Portugal is a fairly small market, we have seen over 1,000 companies in the last two years, the vast majority of them from Portugal and quite a few also from Spain, of course. But our main focus is, is Portugal. And out of these 1,000 companies, we have closed nine, right? We have deployed 15 million euros of, of, of investment. Uh, not all of it is is public, so we cannot disclose uh, the, the details within these these nine investments. I think we have disclosed only six or seven up till now. But as you see in the bucket at the bottom of do not proceed, there's over 500 million euros of, of investment, almost 1,000 companies. And then this is like any sales funnel. You know, we have prospects, we have companies which are we're watching, others which we are doing the first meeting, second meeting, and so on until we, we go into a deep screening and eventually uh, try to, to reach an agreement for investment uh, in the company. But it gives you a sense of the size of the market. This is not too different in terms of, of ratio from other top VCs or from top VCs, which is less about, about 1%, 0 0.5 to 1% of the companies that you review, you end up in investing. In our case, nine out of 1,050. Uh, more or less. And this gives you a little bit of a sense of, of, of what is the Portuguese uh, tech market. And before I move on to, to other, other areas of interest, maybe it would be interesting to um, get some questions or some feedback from, from you and from other people. Great, thank you so much, Stefan. That was very comprehensive. Um, you know, my initial question is, um, out there we may have uh, two groups of people, uh, some startups or people who are looking to work with a, a, a fund like Indigo uh, Partners, or people who are looking to invest in something and how do they get started? So um, how would you address both of those groups? If someone is looking for funding and you sort of went over the criteria, right, that, that your company looks for, but what would be their first step and how do they, you know, start to seek out funding? And then on the flip side, if someone is looking to invest um, in a business in Portugal, where should they start? Right. So I think that, you know, if you're, if you're, I think there's actually three types of interventions that people can have. And we've seen, uh, you know, both Portuguese that, that, that live abroad uh, investing in Portugal and also entrepreneurs, Portuguese entrepreneurs that live abroad trying to get investment from Portugal and also the opposite. There's all sorts of, of uh, possibilities. Let's start with the entrepreneurs. I think that, you know, just to cover a little bit um, again, what I, what I just said about the criteria, the first big decision and the first big, conscious, uh, self-conscious about what you're doing is, is this a VC type of business or not? I think that if, if it's a VC type of business, if you think that you have a Ronaldo in, in your head and, and if you have a, you know, a Ronaldo type of potential uh, in your business, then you're in VC, your VC material and you have to comply with these three major criteria. Are you solving, are you really Ronaldo? Which means, are you unique? You know, can you be number one in the world potentially? I mean, are you playing in a big field? So is, is the problem that you're solving really, really huge? And do you have the stamina and the drive to, to make it happen? And, and if you have these three criteria, then you could uh, obviously approach VCs and angels, uh, both in Portugal and abroad. When you're an, at an early stage of developing your company, you should always have local investors. I mean, I'll give you an example. We, we obviously um, have a pretty good franchising here in Portugal. We're not the only ones, but we're, 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 we are in a pretty good situation. But all the foreign funds come to Portugal and they've been coming for many, many years, particularly the European top funds from London, 
France and Germany and so on, they've been coming for, for many years, and sometimes also the, the Silicon Valley funds, but they're not going to invest before we invest or someone like us invests locally. They want to see first the local professional investors getting in, and then they'll come mm -hmm. in at the stage because when companies are really, really young, they need a lot, a lot of local support. So I'd say that for entrepreneurs, if, you're, if you want to be invested by a VC, and you are located in a specific city in Portugal or the US, you should definitely look for local investing in Portugal, local investing in the US before, before you get uh, international investing, unless you're, say, a Portuguese American and you're relocating back to Portugal, and then of course you're gonna, you, sh you should definitely get a Portuguese, a Portuguese investor behind, behind your company. Uh, on, on the flip side, if you're uh, an investor and looking to invest, I would just caution that if, if you're willing to invest yourself as an angel, you should definitely know the area and the, the, the technical part of the business before you move ahead. We see a lot of people uh, you know, just deploying their own money into um, companies which they believe are interesting and amazing because they get excited uh, by the with the vision of the entrepreneurs and they get excited with the entrepreneurs themselves in a the sense that you know there's this contagion from the entrepreneurs that they they believe they'll take on the world but the truth is you have to see a thousand companies to pick you know nine or ten and and quite often you know if you're not a professional uh, investor you don't have the time and the and the network to actually see a thousand companies to then pick one or two so it, it is a little bit like the lottery quite frankly if you're going to invest uh, directly in an area that you do not know you have not worked throughout your life uh, if you have worked throughout your life in that area fine you're probably an expert and you probably know what you're doing and still you you might not know the financial part of it but at least you know you know the industry if you're not i would be very cautious of of investing we have a lot of investors a lot of very very successful entrepreneurs that invested in our fund because they have decided that they would rather invest through a fund uh, and be close. And, and many of our investors are very close to some of our portfolio companies and they invest side by side with us on some deals. But first they go through the fund to make sure that, that you know, they, they get through those, that screening, that initial screening of hundreds of companies gets done through a, a professional team and they're not just, you know, going on a hunch uh, looking for things. Um, on the other hand, I see also a lot of people, uh, particularly also uh, Portuguese that are abroad, wanting to give back and wanting really mm -hmm. to help the companies in, in different capacities. I would say that um, this is absolutely uh, fantastic in a sense that these companies, they need senior uh, advice and they need experience. Um, but again, I'd say that there's probably two criteria that you have to take into account. Number one, um, tech uh, companies and, and startups are, you know, the type of selling, marketing, and even technical expertise that they require is very specific. So it is not necessarily easily translatable when you have done a more traditional industry that you are, you end up being able to help very significantly uh, in these new uh, sort of artificial intelligence or software uh, companies. If you've done things in the industry, fine. If you haven't, it is really difficult to translate uh, also because these companies, they change very quickly. And so you're either on top of it or, or you, you end up not being able to help as much as you, as you can. The other thing is that sometimes these companies do not have, um, you know, the, the financial capacity to, to pay for that sort of advice. So there's mm -hmm. people that would like to help and they're fine with, you know, just giving back. And there's people which would rightly so, you know, expect some compensation. And you, it's, it's important to establish immediately from the get-go with the company whether they can actually afford it and whether it's actually in their uh, plan to have that sort of expertise. Because I have seen quite often some misunderstandings of people, uh, you know, trying to help. And then in the end, uh, they could have a very valuable contribution. And for uh, many reasons, they end up not, not finding a solution uh, to help. Again, what, what we do with lots of other of our investors is we match them once we know that in addition to being investors, they want to advise companies. We then try to do the matchmaking within the fund for them to help, if not permanently, at least on, on specific situations, help the companies according to their own expertise and to the specific need of, of, of the company. 
Right, and, and to the point about compensation, sometimes it's not always any uh, uh, equity that, right? But that could take a long time to pay for off sure, and you have to sure. understand and that also, going and also in, also equity is also in high demand, right? So so the, the equity stakes that are normally given out to advisors are small and they'll be, they will be normally subject to heavy dilution. If things go well, they will be diluted massively by the, by the capital that comes in, which doesn't mean that the returns cannot be fantastic in a period of you know, five to seven years and multiple times uh, what you have put in, or even if you haven't put in anything, you can have a very nice payout, but it is a capital gain, a capital gain in a sense mm -hmm. that if you don't have any capital, if you don't put massive amounts of capital, your return on an absolute basis will always be fairly small unless and with you know a few exceptions right um so you've talked a lot about tech and in our preparation conversation uh yesterday we talked a little bit about uh other industries in in portugal so just being there in lisbon uh what are some of the other industries that you have observed are growing and could have the potential for people to invest if they're looking to to get a foothold in portugal Yes, I mean, I'll start with the obvious two that everybody likes to, to mention and that have been doing rather well. Um, there's obviously nuances, but, you know, the hospitality and travel uh, industry, the tourism industry in general has been uh, an incredible performance, has seen an incredible performance for the last five to six years. I think that, you know, for, for people that live here like us, it's 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 kind of funny, right? That people suddenly discover your your city and your country when uh, it's always been here, and you know the the bacalhau con natas is still the same as it used to be. Of course, now what you see in Lisbon and in many other places in the country is that it's a much more multicultural, more sophisticated, also because of all the foreign investment and, and foreign investment that came in and that just elevated the whole level. But I think that there's still a lot to be done in the tourism sector, particularly in land where there are, um, you know, absolute jewels of, of villages and, and small areas which are pristine and that can be uh, sustainably uh, developed uh, in many ways. And also, of course, in the main cities, there are still many, many opportunities. Uh, so I think that is a sector that uh, now that uh, Portugal and Lisbon and Porto in particular have become very fashionable. I wouldn't expect it to keep on increasing in these sort of heavy centers, but I don't think it would decrease either, right? So now we have reached a, a, probably, probably a plateau that will keep on rising a little bit, but there is already, so Lisbon and Portugal are now sort of gold standard in terms of tourism uh, globally. So it's quite safe to, to, to come up with new ideas and new uh, proposals to keep on increasing the quality of the offering of, of the tourism sector in Portugal. I think there's still a lot that could be done mm -hmm. to increase the service, to increase the quality of the offering, uh, because the demand is there. Even if it doesn't in, in, increase a lot, there is going to be a lot of demand for quality over the next uh, few years, both in the city centers and also inland and obviously by the beach. So there's still right. a lot. Similarly, in real estate, I think it's a very similar it's a very similar story of course people now say well now the prices are really really high yes it's true but uh, if you compare to many other cities in europe still low. Not, not that high right mm -hmm. and quite frankly when you look at a city like lisbon uh, and porto when you look at the streets probably there's still half of 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 the of the refurbishment that has been done yet so there's a lot to be done yet there's also a lot that will come online. So of course I would caution people to sort of uh, not, you know, not buy overpriced properties because there's a lot coming online from the investment that was done in the last few years. But again, outside of the city centers uh, and you know, not too far uh, from, from the city center of, of the major cities, there are still many, many opportunities of, of places which are uh, beautiful and that are really, really close. And again, inland and by the sea, there's many areas of the country which are yet to, to be developed. So again, real estate, depending on, on where you look at, and if you just don't buy at any price and at, at super, super prime, which is, which is probably now at the top of, of, of the pricing range, at least for the next few years. I think there's lots of opportunities when you have, when you're looking long-term, 
there's lots of opportunities to come in and to increase quality of real estate and and tourism if if you want me to to share other other ideas of other potential areas i would say that uh, uh, agriculture is still a very very interesting uh, area to invest as well uh, of course i'm not an expert so i'm not going to recommend whether you should grow uh, berries or or strawberries <laughs> i don't know that but i can see that there is a return uh, you know to the to to agriculture there is a return to quality to bio to you know uh, being close to 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 the land and and i think people are willing more and more to pay for quality and to and to pay for 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 bio products and 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 genuine um, small uh, production and local production so i think there is a there's something to be said about that has is about uh, uh, specialized manufacturing and in that i would i would probably um, divide it into two or three areas one is portugal is very well known for specialty uh, you know textiles and shoes and and many other uh, those type of more traditional industries that have become extremely competitive in portugal because of the short runs and high tech involved in producing you know for all the famous brands and also some portuguese uh, brands uh, but you also have a return to the original ways of doing things and and there's a lot of very high end design capacity and also architecture as you know but very very good design capabilities in portugal and so there are there are skilled workers and there's a return to manual skills coupled with new design and certainly new ways of doing marketing as you would see in in many other top end countries so there's opportunities to revitalize also because of the tourism and because of the increase in, in capacity uh, in, in, in wealth in the country to, for people to pay for what is original and what is uh, done, you know, customized and done by hand and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that these areas, you know, they're very different from, from agriculture and from tourism and so on, but, you know, manufacturing, uh, be it design-led or uh, technology-led, is also having uh, a resurgence and is doing rather well and the exports of the country prove exactly that. Okay. I believe we have a question from the line, one of our attendees. Hey, Stephen, can you hear me? I can, Paul. Okay, great. Hey, quick question. Um, I saw on your breakdown on your investment, um, it seemed a large portion, 60% was from Luxembourg and very yep. small from the U.S. Uh -huh. Is that on core because of the financial center in Luxembourg or is that a immigrant base that is investing back to uh, Portugal? Uh, that's a very good question. Very insightful that you notice that. Uh, actually, what happens is um, the U.S. has a huge breadth of types of investors, right? So you have obviously pension funds, you know, everyone has a private pension fund or so. There, you know, university endowments are huge obviously there's a lot of high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals and family offices and so on in europe if you think of it because of our social system a lot of the pension funds are actually public and they cannot invest in these type of of assets and a lot of universities again are public and they, they cannot invest in these types of, of asset classes which are deemed more risky and they're not straight you know bonds or things like that and 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 also you know for just regular investors even for high net worth individuals or sophisticated investors they tend to be a little bit more conservative than the us investors so what happens is that because of the, the and, and also capital markets are slightly less developed as you know of course uh, or way less developed than in in the us also because europe is not a country it's a it's a it's a group of countries and so we don't have a, such a, a huge market uh, after all uh, despite the fact that we are even more people than the U.S. And so what happens is that there are some mechanisms within the European Union to sort of make sure that there is capital available for, 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 for example, venture capital. Uh, you cannot have in Europe the amount of uh, science and technology that we produce because it's not only about Portugal, right? You know, there's huge centers of science and technology all over Europe, just like in the U.S., not uh, not better or worse, just just they're there, but then the capital side of it is not there. So we have the capacity in Europe, but we do not have the same uh, access to capital. So the European Union has a certain number of instruments 
which are very important and form to a certain extent the basis of also the venture capital industry. Uh, and in particular in our case and for all the all the funds, all the major funds in, in Europe, literally, you know, only only very, very few American funds and uh, the funds that can't get it, don't don't get it. Uh, they have uh, an institution called the European Investment Fund, which essentially is sort of a cornerstone investor in uh, all the major European funds. What we did when we raised the fund was to think, look, let's first go, if we pass through uh, the difficult process of raising through the European Investment Fund, because they have public money, but also private money, and they're really, really tough. And they, 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 it takes like a year and a half of due diligence where they screen all your past, both personal and professional, and they look at all the deals you've done throughout your life and whether you've made mistakes and so on. And they go to a lot of, a lot of detail, you know, a year and a half, it's, you know, it explains for itself how difficult it is. And, and they will give you, in our case, they gave us up to 50% of the first closing and they're based in Luxembourg. And that's why you see that there is a big, big percentage from Luxembourg because it's the European investment fund, which is essentially the gold standard of investors, you know, they have billions and billions in the management and they've been underpinning the industry with very, very good results for, for many years, but they're very, very hard to get. So we will, once we got that investor, then we were able to go to other private investors and public investors and say, look, we, we, we have now, you know, the stamp of approval of the major investor in the continent and probably in the world at this stage. And so, you know, you can trust that the due diligence was done properly. And, and it just saves everybody a lot of time. They also negotiate with you all the terms you know, it's, they basically tell you what the terms are because they, without them, they <laughs> don't exist. So essentially they tell you what you're going to get and, um, and they ask many, many questions and you go through hell with legal and, and then you come out and you, and you're, you're set to, to, to raise with, with other types of private investors. Okay. That's great. And one follow-up question. Um, do you have other rounds that are opening and are, are you looking for any kind of investments especially from the maybe smaller to medium size uh, angel investors? Yes, in two ways. So number one, we are still raising capital for our own funds. So we have until the end of the year, we can accept investors still for our own fund. The minimum ticket is 250,000 uh, euros for um, non-accredited investors and, and half a million euros for institutional investors, so to say. And so that those, so we're, Every week we raise a bit more, sometimes much more, sometimes uh, small investors come in um, and also for our companies. Uh, so of course, for our companies, it depends at which stage they are. Um, and whenever there's room in, in the round of capital first, our investors uh, have no, 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 not a legal right, but they obviously, whenever we have a, a, an investor in our fund that would like to come in, uh, directly also in one of the opportunities, of course, if it, if it makes sense for all parties uh, and not in detriment of the fund, of course, they would come in first. And then sometimes we have room for other angel investors. Once companies hit the sort of pre-Series A and Series A rounds, it starts getting tougher because at that stage, if they're doing well, uh, you know, this is this industry is a winner takes all industry, both for the funds and for the companies. The funds that do well always do well, and the companies that do well uh, end up attracting uh, disproportionate amounts of capital. So once once you reach this threshold of of three to five million at least rounds of capital, so getting onto Series A, then the foreign funds that work with us, which means all of them, all of the top funds in Europe, we tell them, look, we're raising our company has has reached these metrics, these milestones, which are internationally recognized as the metrics you need to raise a, a new round of capital. And then, of course, the rounds get a little bit more complicated. So uh, the space normally that there is for small investors, it's on the earlier stage when obviously things are riskier, but when that's also when you get higher returns, of course. And once things start getting a little bit more secure, the foreign bigger funds start coming in. And of course, then there's a little bit less room for 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 angels but and and also on top you know of course our investors have preference in terms of getting in if there's still room and so that's how it works but but yes there's room now and again there's room for 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 other investors and we're more than happy to speak with anyone that is interested in 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 investing in one of our portfolio companies thank you 
Excellent. Well, we have reached our time. Um, uh, we are at the hour. So if you have any other questions, everybody out there, please. Um, uh, Stefan's email was on the cover slide and, and we can send it out again. You can email him directly or you can email us at uh, palcus at palcus.org and we can get the question to him. Um, <clears throat> but thank you uh, very much, Stefan, for your time. We really appreciate it. It was so informative. And I hope the people out there feel a little bit um, more prepared and and confident now uh, to go forward and, and take some steps to invest in, in the many industries that are available in, in Portugal. And, um, and like you said, if you're in Portuguese American, giving back in, in some way. So I'm just yep. gonna take, uh, take control back here so I can, um, if it'll let me, uh, yeah, reclaim host, just so I can do a few um, closing slides. Oops, sorry about that, okay. Um, so thank you everybody again for attending. All of our webinars are archived on our YouTube channel um, and most are on our website as well. We will also provide a PDF of this presentation on our website and our Facebook page. Please share this resource with family and friends. It's free for everybody. Um, and if you have an idea for a webinar, please let us know. We are, are open to any and all ideas. And if you'd like to sponsor a webinar, these are free to the community and uh, the support of sponsors really enable us to continue making these free to everybody. And we've reached um, over you know, 10,000 people plus with our webinars so far. So if you um, are interested in this, please give us a call. And with that, I will say thank you again, Stefan. Thank you, everybody. And obrigado and have a great day. All right. Thank you.